Let's get started. Um, oh, Faye, do you know the person at your section who corrected the homework? Do you know who that person is? Remember the homework there was the, the diagram was wrong? The homework three? Uh, I don't know. You remember who that is? When they volunteer themselves to you, you won't be able to find them? Okay, so there's a mistake in the homework three. It's not a critical mistake. It is merely a unclarity. And correcting the mistake will make your life easier. I already uploaded it. On the old one, this is problem number two. On the old one, the diagram goes like this. Okay? The way it should have gone. is like this, okay? So the, all this garbage is in here. This uh, circle of uh, what, hap what did nature do is in the wrong spot. It was right here, okay? So nature moves left? No. The wording on it is exactly correct. Where I put the circle is wrong. Okay. This implies, in terms of the jargon of game theory, this implies that number two doesn't know what number one did. Number two does know what number one did, which is one of those two moves. But then number two does not know what nature does. So, it's everybody, all the information is exactly the same as before. Except now, it's correct in terms of the diagram. So whoever made that correction to Faye in section gets a point added to their course grade. They were confused about it? Then they don't. <laughs> well, maybe they do. I don't know. You decide. You're a dictator of that point. So one still only has two options, like player one up, or down. up and down, and then nature chooses up or down. Right. And then player two, okay, because right now it looks like player one has four choices. Player one does not have four choices. Okay. So what? who's making the decision at those second nodes? This is nature. This is nature is making this decision. One is making a decision, and then number two is making a decision, not knowing what's going on. Okay? So the wording is correct, the answer is the same, the question is the same, the diagram is wrong. I'm just changing the diagram, okay? The di if you actually, I, you should not have relied on the wrong diagram, or you should not have worried about that, because if you relied on the wrong diagram, you would have made a mistake, because you would have contradicted the wording. Now the correct diagram is up. Those of you in class have been warned, and those of you who are listening to this tape whenever it shows up on the internet will also have been warned. Okay? Good. That's due on Tuesday. Um, there's an organization called the Koch Foundation. They're sending out propaganda uh, for internships in Washington, D.C. I have hard copy propaganda. Here, this is one of those gold-plated things that you get paid like $10,000 for a summer internship. It's free market angle if you're interested in that kind of ideology. Come and see me after class. I will send out an email with all the same garbage so you can look at it. Okay? Um, they're a very good organization. The Coke, apparently the Coke company is one of the larger, or if not the largest private company in the United States. Something like very, very big. And they are more libertarian market oriented, so they put their money where their mouth is and they fund internships for um, students and uh, associate thingies, one year jobs for people that are just graduated. Okay, so look into that if you want to go into the sausage machine in DC. Um, briefings. We are going to hand back the briefings next Tuesday. Uh, we've done the vast majority of the grading, there's a whole bunch of uh, point scoring, correlation, that, that averaging going on. My overall impressions, uh, to be brief, I'll give you more uh, next week, is that uh, a lot of you did a very good job. Uh, there were new ideas in there that I had not thought of before to solve collective action problems. This is exactly what I was looking for. Okay? Congratulations for people that um, came up with those ideas. Unfortunately, sometimes your peers didn't recognize your genius. So you may have to wait for the Nobel Prize and not to get the points in the course, but we'll see how that works off. Um, I wanted to point out 
that sometimes a, a really basic idea is really important. And this is, I don't know, have I showed you this bumper sticker before? No? This is my economic policy on a bumper sticker, okay? It says, some water for free and pay for more. Everybody's worried about water shortages. And economists are saying, well, we should price water. You raise the price. Supply is less than demand. And people say, well, wait. What about poor people and water is a human right and da-da-da-da-da? So you have this kind of argument between equity and efficiency. Equity meaning that everybody deserves some, and efficiency meaning you have to price water. And um, I just took a simple idea from, uh, this is in the South African Constitution, it's in a couple other constitutions, which is that everybody has a right to water, but a limited amount of water. Okay, it turns out to be 50 liters per capita per day in South Africa. In Las Vegas they use, um, I have a post on this this morning, 200 gallons per day per capita, right? That's 800 liters more or less, right? So South Africa is 50 liters. And so the simple concept is, let's do some for free, and then if you want to use more than that, you will pay. You will pay a price. And that bumper sticker, this is actually a revolutionary idea as far as water is concerned. Almost no water on the planet is managed with this idea, right? It fits on a bumper sticker. It's a simple idea. Right? So if you guys got it onto your briefing, it might be just as powerful or just as important in terms of solving a major problem. Not to say that it will be implemented immediately, as I found out. So um, I want you guys to have a little bit more context on why this briefing matters in a bigger picture than 10 points. Yeah. Is that your idea? Is that why it's it, This is my know. bumper sticker. Yeah, I made the bumper oh. sticker. Yeah. Um, but the idea of this combines two different concepts, and people don't talk about this in, in, in water. It turns out that, as I mentioned more than once, water is one of the more backwards businesses in this world, and that's why it's so interesting to me, because there's so, many, so much low-hanging fruit, so many easy, um, easy things to understand. It's not like trying to you know, beat the stock market. Okay, just as a clarification, extrinsic motivation, what does that mean? What does it mean? Anybody? Something else is making you want to do something? Something else what? That's not you. That's not you. So pushing you to do something. For example? Like the government is like making you, like a regulation. Maybe. What's another example of extrinsic motivation? Well, like any kind of carrot in front of you that makes you run. So whether that's money that you get paid or whether it's um, admiration from whatever your peers, whatever it is. Okay. Or grades, right? Okay. You're extrinsically motivated by things that are outside of you, grades, money, uh, um, yeah, uh, fans who write you fan mail. Intrinsic motivation, what is that? This side of the room. Come on. Well, like you're doing something because you want to do it and it makes you happy for something based in your For whatever reason. Evaluation. You know, it reminds you of warm cookies, right? This is... The warm fuzzies, okay? So intrinsic motivations, you do it because it's inside of you. You don't actually care necessarily about outside rewards or anything like that. I explain, I'm explain. i saying this again because some people in the briefing did not get this concept clear, okay? And it's actually one of the more basic things that you should know coming out of this course. Not that it's emphasized very often in economics. Economics has often about, uh, been about extrinsic motivation. You just pay people and they'll do it. Right? And as, as I say, people they say, all I care about is money. I say, well, go be a prostitute. And they go, oh, no, no. Well, so clearly there's an issue right, of what makes you happy. And some people are, are going to do certain things for certain uh, reasons, but they have their own um, internal controls. So keep that straight when you're talking about things. And this, both of them go into the utility function, right? Because the utility function is a big bag of everything. Okay. Uh, any questions? Any open questions on any things? No? Okie dokie. Um, as I remember, as I uh, remind you, uh, next week there's no section. This week there is section. Next week we have class. Oh, today's there's a strike. Everything's going well for the striking people. Um, and your homework is due, and I think that's about it. So let's get into discounting, which is some new material. It's all relevant to this whole concept of climate change. So, um, a little bit of jargon on discounting. Often we use this uh, letter delta for the discount rate.
And then if you wanted to, let's talk, what does the discount rate mean? There's two different types, financial and social. And, um, social discount rate less than the financial discount rate. So um, what does a financial discount rate mean? Anybody have a definition of that? You would have got it in Accounting 101. Yes. Is it like what you would pay today for a certain amount tomorrow? It's very much like that. So let's let's look at it in a in a simple dollars and cents thing, right? If you have a dollar today, right, and somebody says, Can I borrow your dollar today? And you say, you want to hold on to it for how long? For a year. Okay. And uh, so let's say that uh, you know, you've got a dollar, and I want to borrow it. I'll give it back to you in a year. Can I give you a dollar back in a year, or do you want more or less than a dollar? More. More. Okay. How much more? Depends on the rates. Depends on the rate, right? Well, that's the, you're just asking me my question back again, right? So, but the, the, assuming, number one, that I am not going to run away and not come back, which is a significant problem, right? the Bernie Madoff problem, Right, but a dollar today, a dollar today might be worth a dollar times one plus d, right, in a year, right, and that delta can be anything from 0.2 percent, which is the money market rate right now in the United States, right, or 50 percent, which is the venture capital rate, if you're going to be investing in a company. Maybe in two or three years, you want that kind of payback. 50% per year. How would you represent 50% per year for a dollar? I'm going to modify this. What would I do? Come on, math people. What? Is it one times 1 plus 5? 1 times 1.5, okay. And I want to do it for three years. To the third. To the third, right? So I'm going to put a T up there for time, okay? Because it's compounding. So why would why would uh, why would I take uh, say I've got uh, I'm a venture capitalist and I I have a million dollars in the bank and the bank is paying me 0.2 uh, percent per year, right? We're just going to assume this per year all the time now, and then. Uh, so and so, the entrepreneur comes up and says, "I'd like to borrow a million dollars from you. I will give you shares of my company in exchange." And then I, the venture capital, say, "Okay, fifty percent interest rate." Why is there such a margin between two percent and fifty percent for me? Is the bank is insured? Right. Well, besides this little issue of how much is insured, a million dollars or whatever. So it's it's it's. The bank is insured, what does that mean compared to the, the venture capitalist? You'll get the 2% per year and you can take the money whenever you want it. Right, so there's a, there's a security of this, right? This is a short thing. And what about the venture capitalist? Someone over here. It's risky because they might not, they're, they're, whatever they're investing in might not be profitable, so you might be getting less than what you What if it's... What if it's like a one in four chance that I get my money back? Let's just say, right? That would be risk, right? Because I'm a venture capitalist. I know that over time all these kids show up and they have all these great ideas, but only one in four really does succeed. So what's my real, what's my real return going to be on that investment with the kid? Assuming I've got a bunch of them. Over time, it's going to be 12.5 because I'm just going to do a risk-adjusted interest rate, right? So it's 12.5% uh, on average, okay? Which could be something along the lines, I actually said 0.2%, not even 2%, right? But say, say that it's 0.2 against 12.5, in a sense, this is my risk-adjusted interest rate Am I risk averse, risk neutral, or risk risk seeking? If I am willing to to consider both of these investments evenly, even Stephen. 
I heard seeking, neutral, and averse. Who thinks, who thinks seeking? Who thinks neutral? Who thinks risk averse? Okay, the risk averse people are right. A risk adjusted 12.5% return essentially says that I'm going to have 0.2% um, uh, with 100% certainty, okay, and I'm willing to trade that off, given this is my opportunity cost here, okay, I'm willing to trade that off for a 50% return with a 25% certainty, okay, that equals 12.5%. 12.5 is significantly larger than 0.2%, right? My risk premium that I'm demanding is essentially 12.3% additional, right? If it was if it was risk adjusted, this is a 50%, 25% chance of paying off, right? If this was a um, if this was if I was risk neutral, what would this 12.5% be equal to? 0.2, right? It would be an even. It would be like a coin flip, right? Risk neutral. If I was risk seeking, this would be equal to what? Less than 0.2. I love investing in projects that might fail. Right? So this venture capitalist is essentially earning a risk premium. Or demanding a risk premium, right? Those are actually the same idea. Venture capitalists are not in the business for charity. They are in the business to make money. And if you get competition among venture capitalists, what's going to happen? It goes down. That 12.3% is going to fall. The risk premium is going to fall. Because everybody's getting in the business, right? It's well known that the, the easiest way, way to make a million dollars in the winery business is to start with a billion dollars. Right? Because so many people fail buying wineries, or baseball teams for that matter. Those are vanity projects. People say, I just made a billion dollars in my dot-com, therefore I am a genius because I got hired by Google. And now I'm going to go invest it in a winery because I'm a genius. And then you lose all your money, right? So the thing is, is that as people enter the winery business, the returns on winery business gets driven down until you go down to risk neutral or even potentially risk seeking, right? And that means a whole bunch of investments get thrown into the winery business that would not happen if there was not this huge demand to invest, right? What happened during the last couple of years in the real estate market <coughs> is what? What's the big word that was in the news? Someone new here. Has anybody heard of real estate? Anybody live in a house? Anybody have parents who own a house? Is there this thing called a mortgage? Upside down, foreclosure, has anybody heard of those words? Okay, what happened? Subprime lending rates. Excuse me? Subprime lending rates. Subprime lending rates, that's a key word. Put a verb and an adjective. What happened? We have a lot of subprime lending rates. There's a lot of subprime lending, is that what you're saying? Okay, so a lot of people who were essentially subprime borrowers were given loans by a lot of what? Stupid banks? Greedy banks? Greedy. Greedy. Here, take my money. Take my money. I'm greedy to give you my money. It's one of those, I think there's, I think it's kind of like, you know, pointing the finger going on. Oh, I didn't want that money to buy the big screen TV. Right? So what happened is this wall of money went into real estate and people that could not get loans got loans. People that could not, that had to put a down payment got a 0% down payment. People that had, um, uh, and people that were renters started becoming buyers. So prices went up, right? Everybody felt wealthier because their equity went up. They got second mortgages. They invested that in the big screen TVs and the, and the dually trucks and all that stuff. And then lo and behold, the demand for housing fell through a hole, right? Because it was a, it's almost like a Ponzi scheme. The, what would happen is that people would sell their houses to buy a more expensive house, and they could get a loan to buy a more expensive house, and they kept leveraging up. But as soon as the, the people stopped coming in on the bottom of the pyramid, buying new houses, 
you lost demand. You lose demand, the pricing momentum stops, and now you're not making money on leveraging your equity and cashing out your equity. You actually have to pay, make your payment. And the worst thing was that sometimes they had these uh, so-called arms, adjustable rate mortgages, and the teaser rate would come in at 1% and it would readjust to 5%. Right? And when your mortgage payment goes from $1,500 to $4,000 a month, and you only make $40,000 a year, or $50,000 or $60,000 a year, if you make $60,000 a year and your mortgage is $50,000 a year, you are not doing well. Right? So what happened is, supply, the supply of housing was fixed, or it was expanding slower than demand, prices jacked up, and then the market collapsed because people couldn't afford it anymore. Right? It was based on a bunch of people coming into the business, trying to invest in real estate, driving down the risk premium, and then a whole bunch of risky people were getting loans. Right? And it was pushing up demand from all the people that were good risks. The, it's the, the, the economics of real estate in the last couple of years were surreal, and now they are also surreal in the sense that I think it's 40% um, of people in California have houses that are worth less than the loans on them. That means they can literally walk away from their house and make money. Except that they have, you know, emotional, intrinsic attachments. Yeah. Well, there's one thing I don't understand. So after this whole failure, I mean, after the, the rates went up and then lots of people got evicted and the banks got left with all these houses for sale, what I don't understand is why did the bank say, okay, since you can't afford the four thousand dollars, but you've been able to afford the thousand, and our choice is either to keep making a thousand or to get this thousand dollars every month, or to sit there with an empty house that we can't sell because nobody wants an empty house. I mean, right. nobody wants a house right now. Right. Why did they just say, okay, we'll make a deal with you and we'll readjust the mortgage? There's, down. there's, that's a what? What would that be in principal agent terminology? What would happen if you're the bank that just decided to readjust for people? couldn't pay their mortgages. Are there other people in this world? I'm paying $4,000 a month, and you're the bank, and you're saying, you could pay 1000 Does anybody else in the room observe what just happened? No, no but I mean, I'm saying that you can't pay the $4,000. i am saying you're in a situation where it's sort of bank has... That's right, I can't. How about 1000 Does anybody else have a mortgage in the real estate market? Yeah. Your borrowers? The ones who can still afford to pay four thousand, what are they going to do? Whoa! I'll pay a thousand, right? So if you only have ten percent of your loans are non-performing, the jargon, ninety percent are performing. If you give a break to that ten percent, everybody else, the other ninety percent, are like, wait a second, right? They want adjustments down too. But what when it gets to the point where fifty percent are not performing, fifty percent only fifty? I mean, when that when it the number of people who cannot pay the 4000 anymore right. outweighs by far the people who can, mm -hmm. then you end up with 10 people who can pay that and stay in the houses and 90 empty houses, which you can't sell. It hasn't gone that far, but that's an interesting idea. It's, it's never gone that far before. Would, would doing something like that affect the, peop the people that the bank sold the mortgages to? Oh, the resale of the mortgages? Yeah. So oh, so, that's, like, so this is actually a much bigger problem, so right? Long. A lot of mortgages were, I used to be a mortgage broker. So it's a little bit of jargon. Right? Mortgage brokers are usually fools and thieves, but anyway. Not. The bank doesn't actually own different like this. Yeah, so what happens is if you're a homeowner and you get a loan, the broker, me, I'll go to the bank, I'll say, countrywide financial, I got a loan here from someone who says they're worth a million bucks. And they're called liar loans, actually, or ninja loans. No income, no job, right? And... Uh, so I got a ninja loan for someone who says they're worth a million bucks, they can pay $6,000 a month. The bank says, oh, looks good to me. I'll buy that loan from you, the broker. I get paid my fee. I get three or $4,000. I put that on my payment on my Mercedes, which I ride around. And then the bank, uh, Countrywide, flips it over into the secondary market where it gets bought by insurance companies that are looking for long-dated securities. They're looking for stuff that's 30-year maturity. Right? Because insurance companies need to match maturity against their liabilities, which are their insurance policies. So then the, the mortgage broker countrywide says, great, I just made a half a point. 
let's turn that money and put it back in the market, go get some more ninjas, right? So the secondary, the insurance companies are like, holy cow, we have all these loans. What we should do, let's buy credit default swap swaps. Because that means that if we have default on our loans, which have been cut, sliced and diced by Morgan Stanley and, all, and, and Goldman Sachs, then if there's a default, we're guaranteed against it and we'll buy that insurance from AIG, which is the company that went bankrupt to the tune of $150 billion or more of tax money, right? So AIG says, sure, we'll buy it and if we get a reward, then we're going to make a fortune and if we lose, then the government will bail us out because we're too big to fail. Everything ended up shifting into our pockets, the taxpayers, right? So that's how this huge Ponzi scheme in the financial business happened. And the, in terms of, oh my God, what about foreclosures? There was no, there's no need to police your borrowers. You just sold that loan three times, three times ago, right? Massive, massive moral hazard problems, right? And now the government has completely fucked it up, like unbelievably. Like forget the water business. Right? They've unbelievably fucked it up by essentially guaranteeing all these banks that have screwed up. Only one has gone bankrupt so far, Morgan Stanley, or uh, Lehman, right? And after 150 years of business. And and Bear, no, Bear, did Bear go under or Lehman? No, Bear was uh, sold on the cheap. They were rescued. Right? Instead of $80 a share, it was like $2 a share. And it ended up going up to 10 I think that was the uh, deal. Anyway, so that was a little... That was a little, uh, I, I wanted to take that kind of little side trip into discount rates and, and interest rates because there is a supply and a demand for money, right? And that's how these rates go up and down. Now, there's a, I want to take the last hand here and I want to get into social discount rates because we're never going to get through this. Oh, I was just My going to say, on to the point about what should the banks take for market mortgages, there, is, there are programs where the government subsidizes part of the mortgage for low income houses. Right. Um, so that kind of gets at the same idea. It's basically if you like actually can't pay, they will so that subsidize some of your home, especially if you're a veteran or... So. Right. The government actually has been at the center of this problem in terms of causing this with the subsidies. I mean, I think you're trying to say something that the government's doing that's good, but it turns out that it's like it's 10 times good. worse. Oh. oh. No, because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were the, the big buyers of mortgages and guarantors of mortgages, started issuing guarantees like it was uh, Christmas. Oh, I just mean in the wake of everything. Well, in the wake, they're trying to guarantee people that, that conceivably can pay but are a little bit underwater, yeah. just need a little help. Right? I, I don't know if that's necessarily good. What's happened, is, what's happened is they've said, we're going to renegotiate your loan, we're going to lower your payment, and about half of the people that had their loans renegotiated have started missing payments again. They just basically should never have gotten loans, right? And they're essentially declaring bankruptcy, which is a huge problem because uh, it's not that you know living on a cash basis is such a huge problem, but it's ha it's nice to have credit, right? And uh, predatory lending is the word that gets thrown around. I there is this notion of borrowing, so I kind of you know lay blame on both sides. But the government completely. Uh, mess this up in terms of guaranteeing a lot of banks that probably should have gone bankrupt long ago, like 20 years ago. So the same way that the airline should have gone bankrupt and GM and, and Chrysler should have gone bankrupt. But, uh, Betty, Claire, um, Betty May and they're not um, government agencies. Oh, yes. Right? Aren't they privatized? Nope. They were, well, it was even worse than that. It was, it was private profit and social risk. They were G GCSEs, government-sponsored corporate entities. And they were uh, guaranteed by the government, but they had shareholders who were making profits. Right? That's pretty much a sweet deal. I mean, if you want to start paying off congressmen in terms of getting laws to help you out, that's the structure you want. If I make money, I keep it. If I lose money, you take it. Right? That's completely what happened. And they've lost over two hundred billion dollars. Right? And they're still. And now they're flooding the market with more uh, mortgage stuff. Right? So we're not at the end of the real estate meltdown yet. What's the thing here called a social discount rate, and why is it lower? What does it mean, social discount rate? Make up a definition. Somebody new? Uh, how yeah. much uh, you value the current quality of resources and current use of resources versus their quality and their presence in the future? Mm, close. 
That could be, this actually, what you just said could be used for the decision of whether or not I should mine today. I've got gold in the ground, should I bring it out today or should I leave it till tomorrow, right? So the question of how are you going to use your resources today versus tomorrow will be influenced by the financial discount rate. That's what I told you before, that optimal extinction idea, right, or wiping out a resource. What is social discount rate? Think of the word root social. <coughs> the discount rate has something to do with the future, right? Close, more. The future of what? Not money, not resources. Society. Society, right? It's one of those really tough definitions. Okay? The social discount rate, the rate of, of uh, the, wh where you want to discount the future in terms of social goods, right? Most notably, the climate, right? Do we care about having a clean climate today versus tomorrow? Or rather, do we care about burning fossil fuels today versus having a climate tomorrow? The social discount rate is what was being used in the calculation of how to deal with the cost-benefit of climate change. Okay? There was a report put out, the Stern report, very, very famous in the climate change lit. I think it was about 2008, and Nicholas Stern, who is a smart guy, basically said, now, usually the financial discount rate, if you want to just throw out, someone says, give me a discount rate, you can throw out a number, 3%, 5%, or whatever. If you have a 3% discount rate, think about this here, and you're looking 50 years in the future, Oh, let me, let me give you a, a, the inversion of this, the discount factor. The discount factor basically says, what is a dollar in the future worth, right? So if I have a, a if I have, or a, a value in the future, I'm going to call it value in year T times D sub T is equal to value now. So let's start with some obvious things. If your discount rate is zero, D of T is what? One. A value of the future is how much in current value? One dollar in the future is worth how much today? One. Okay? A dollar today, a dollar tomorrow. Now, if we are discounting the future like you would if, you, if the way you guys learned about um, time preference, basically if you put a 3% discount on something and you take 1.03 to the 50th and you put that under here, this D is going to be greater than 1 or less than 1? Less than 1, okay? So a future dollar is not worth so much today. A future benefit. If you, in, if you spend a dollar today to get a dollar of benefits in 50 years, is that a good deal if you have a discount rate above 0? It's not a good deal, right? If you spend a dollar today and it's $50, 50 years in the future, someone can sit there and do this with a calculator, we can figure out if it's worth it or not. Okay, but you do need to discount it to what we also call present value, right? Net present value is removing the cost of the, of the investment today. Has everybody heard of net present value? If you don't, look it up, right? It's the same as present discounted value. Yeah, it's all these letters get scrambled around, right? Present discounted value, net present value. Present discounted value does not include the net investment. Okay, you spend a dollar today, that, but the present discounted value is the value in the future put in today's terms. Okay? Now, what we know is that as, as, the, as the discount rate goes up, the value of that future benefit falls. Okay? So if it's $50 in 50 years and my discount rate is 
or 1%, let's just do 1%. If it's 1% for $50 in 50 years versus 5%, which one makes that $50 worth more today? 1%? Raise your hand. 5%? Good. No. 1%. Okay? Zero? Like, just think of the zero number, right? If it's zero, it's $50. That's the biggest it'll ever get, right? You do not, we're not going negative, okay? So, if you have a low discount rate, then um, you're going, the, the future is worth more today. That's essentially the, the logic, okay? If you're investing money in a mine or something like that and you have a low discount rate, then you're willing to wait for those returns on your investment over a longer amount of time. <coughs> if you have a high discount rate, you're less patient. You want your money sooner. If you're a venture capitalist and you want 50% per year, you want your money now or a lot of money. Same thing, right? Now, Social discount rates, I have just asserted, are lower than financial discount rates. Why would they be lower? Tragedy of the commons? No. Mm. Why would they be lower? Society. What's the most obvious connection between us in this room and the future in a hundred years? A hundred years. We die, but society will keep going, presumably. Who is society? Everyone? Well, someone else. Think biologically. Think of the clinic down the road. Anybody intending to have any kids? Your parents did, I hope, right? <laughs> right? So, the future is us. In biological terms, in the survival of the, our genes, the future are our genes, right? We care more about the future than we do about financial returns because it's us. That's the logic behind that. So, I, I don't actually understand then why you even have the social discount rate at all. Like, it should, I mean, I think it should be zero simply for the fact that our future... So the social discount rate should be zero? Should be zero because our children will need, still need a gallon of water and 2,000 calories a day to survive. They won't need all of a sudden less because of the discount rate and they can survive of less. So, the apple today should be worth exactly the same as the apple tomorrow because it will give them just as much energy. So there's no point. To so the, the zero the discount, a low discount rate, social discount rate is appropriate. What's an argument against a low social discount rate? And I don't mean relative to financial. We're here, they're not. We don't give a shit, right? <laughs> That's a good one. It's very common, right? Whatever, kids. I'm not whatever. You know, they're not my kids or something like that. They're the wrong kind of kids. You can either say like generations are limitless in the future, or the world's going to end in 2012. Like... If the world's going to end in 2012, definitely party, right? <laughs> Cash in, and, and money be worth nothing either, so just go and, and, and buy all those apples and those more like <coughs> beer and stuff like that. Well, like technology might get better, so they might not need everything that much better. This is actually a very important comment, okay? A hundred years ago, we didn't have, uh, I'm not going to say we didn't have iPods, that's not necessarily relevant, but we didn't have the standard of living for exactly the same things, right? Our clothing was not as cheap or as high quality, right, because of technology. I'm not even talking about mining natural resources, okay? <coughs> mining natural resources is a huge disaster, but technology has made our lives better in many ways, in the sense of... Uh, medical technology, drugs, or even the most basic stuff, vitamins, all right? Taking your vitamins, or not dying of an infection because of penicillin, basic stuff, right? So, if you think in the future, should I sacrifice now so that my poor kids in the future have that money? Well, wait a second, they're going to have all this cool, they're going to have flying cars. Maybe I should sacrifice less, because they'll, they'll make up for it. So there's an argument against a high, social, uh, low social discount rate, okay? The, the fact is, is that the social discount rate should be lower than the financial discount rate. Where to set it is a different story. People that are techno-optimists, um, and there's a, a, a big group of them there. There's a, there's a famous, there was a famous bet, actually, between uh, Julian Simon and 
Uh, Paul Ehrlich. I, almost, I usually spell his name wrong. I think it's this way. Julian Simon was a techno-optimist. Ehrlich is dead, uh, alive and Simon is dead. He was not that optimistic, I guess. But um, they made a bet. And Ehrlich was one of those, the world is going to end, population is out of control, and Simon was like, don't worry about it, we're humans, we always fix the problem. And so they kind of had this rhetorical battle going on, and I don't know who started it, but basically... Is kind of like, put your money where your mouth is. And Ehrlich said, we're running out of resources. We're going to be impoverished in the future. And Ehrlich, uh, that's what Ehrlich said. And Simon said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And so Simon said, I think Simon started it. He's like, okay, I'll bet you. I'll bet you that five of those resources that we're running out of, metals, are going to be cheaper in the future than they are today. What would that reflect, cheaper in the future than they are today? There's a fixed supply, right? We're talking metals. And who knows what's going on with demand? Usually demand is rising. Ehrlich's, Ehrlich's belief was that we're running out of things like oil, we're running out of uh, coal, we're running out of gold, we're running out of palladium, or whatever the hell it is. Okay? So the price, what would Ehrlich say the price is going to be in the future? Higher or lower than today? Higher. Higher. And Simon was like, nope, it'll be lower. And, and Simon said, choose, you choose any five metals you want. We'll, we'll buy $1,000 worth of them, and, and we'll get the quantity, and in 10 years we'll check in and see what they're worth. And if they're worth more than $1,000 in constant dollars, then you win, because they are scarcer. Does everybody understand this bet? And, and I will pay you the difference. So it was cash, right? It was a futures hedge. He, I don't think he hedged it, actually. That would have been even more funny. But anyway, he didn't hedge it. And if, if it goes, the price goes down, you pay me the difference. So who won? Oh, so like, Wait, when was this done? Around 80, 1980. Who thinks Simon won? Who thinks Ehrlich won? Simon won. It's not universally true that Simon would have won every time, and actually I, have a, I, I wrote a blog post on this a, over a year ago saying that uh, Ehrlich bet on the wrong thing. It was kind of a sucker bet. But Simon got, or Ehrlich got to choose the medals he wanted, so he actually he kind of backed himself into his own corner, right? But the fact was is that the, the technology advanced faster than demand. Technology meant that we could get more bang for our buck out of those metals. And if you think about the most obvious one, copper. What's happened with the demand for copper in the last couple of years? Kind of. But over the last 20 years. I know you guys wake up every morning and look at copper futures. <laughs> What's happened with copper? What does copper get used for? Uh, it's gone down because it's out of fiber optic cables or replacing one of them. Right. Copper wiring. You could buy fiber. Right? Which is made out of glass, which is made out of sand, which is pretty damn common. Except in Singapore. Apparently there's a good market for sand in Singapore. Right? So, it turns out that the demand for copper has collapsed relative to the trend. Right? And technology was the one, the thing that, that cut it off at the knees. Okay? So, keep that in mind in terms of an argument against a, a low discount rate. Regardless of that, Stern said we should use a rate of the future. I think it was actually something like 0.2%, which implies that if we're going to spend money today, we'll, send, we'll spend billion, a couple billion dollars today, and we'll get a payback of uh, $20 billion in 50 years in the future. That's a good deal at a low discount rate, right? If the, disc, if the social discount rate was zero, that means... A, a billion dollars today and $20 billion in, in a million years is still an amazing return on investment, right? Just keep the intuition. Don't worry about the exact numbers. So a low discount rate means that the future matters a lot. And essentially what Stern said in his report on climate change, written for the UK government, is it's worthwhile to pay a lot now to avert climate change because the benefits from averting climate change are huge. Does that make sense? That is one of the biggest biggest arguments in climate change, the whole Copenhagen thing. In, now, I'll get into the U.S. Congress in a second. I don't know, Mark Twain said a lot of good things about the U.S. Congress. 
they're all true still, thieves and liars and all that. So that's one of the big issues in climate change, and I'm bringing that up so you guys know. Oh, another piece of jargon you should know is called hyperbolic, or get arm, hyperbolic discounting. That refers to a hyperbola. I don't even know what a hyperbola looks like. Does it look like this or something like that? Like that? Like that? That's a parabola? Hyperbola? What's that? You guys all know what a hyperbola is, right? Okay, good. So hyperbolic discount, here's what it means, the definition. It means, essentially, that if I give you... If I give you a choice and I say, hey, how about, um, would you prefer a uh, dollar tomorrow or two dollars a week? The vast majority, who, said, who says a who says dollar tomorrow? Who wants a dollar tomorrow? Who wants two dollars in a week? So it turns out that people are willing to wait um, for that two dollar thing. But they act as if they want that dollar tomorrow, right? They will not make the, it. Essentially, when you say you have a dollar today, what do you want or what do you want to do? They want the. They want. Or sorry. They. When you give them a choice, let me say this the right way. Did I write anything useful down? People have a much higher discount rate on a tomorrow return than they do on a one week return. Okay. So tomorrow is. They, if you have to wait for, for 24 hours, it's like you've got to give me a lot of money. But if it's a week, like you don't have to give me very much money, which is really weird, right? That means, and I mean relatively speaking, right? Because if you took, if you took let's start today with a dollar, and tomorrow it's two dollars, and, oh, I think this is how it goes, and it's like two dollars and ten cents in a week or a year or something like that. People, people will go for... Um, People are willing to take this, even though this is a much better return. That's kind of the idea. I'm not. I'm not trying to be confusing, but this the the people are willing to be patient. People are willing to be pa be patient farther in the future compared to like when you say have an investing money for your retirement. People are like, yeah, whatever, I'll just throw that money away. But if it's like, I have to wait a year. Oh, I want a big dis I want a lot of money if I have to wait a year. Does that make sense? A lot of money if I have to wait a year, but not very much money if I have to wait 40 years. Which is really weird. But it's very, very common in terms of a pattern. Okay? So it turns out that the one thing that's been adopted as, a, as kind of a, a way of um, uh, using this in, in, to help people, essentially, is by taking money out of your paycheck now and sticking it in a retirement account and saying, you can have it if you want, but we're just sticking it in a, in a retirement account. And people are like, okay, that's fine. They won't sign up for it voluntarily, but if you take it away and then you give them the option of ending the program, just a retirement program stuff, then they'll be like, fine, I don't care. So they don't necessarily want it in their paycheck now. They don't mind it missing from their paycheck now. If, if it's taken away for this future thing. But if you, if you take it away against tomorrow, they're like, oh, no, 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 I want my money now. And I, I don't know if that sounded more convoluted. It sounded pretty convoluted coming out of my head. Does it make any sense to you guys? It doesn't make sense. Do you have a hand up anyway? Say it again. Does it have to do with like a discount, like increasing at a decreasing rate? Like... It's not even that. This discount rate, let's say this discount rate is 20%. This is a, implies a discount rate of 20%. This implies a discount rate of 5%. As you, that's actually probably the easiest way to say it. The sooner the return is to today, the higher the discount rate is that you are going to apply to it. Right? So if we're doing this hyperbola, I'm going to make this, I'm going to call this a hyperbola, okay? In the, in the short term, you want a high discount rate, right? In the long term, you'll take something lower. Which is unusual. Usually you would want more and more and more money to wait longer and longer and longer. But you're willing to give up returns in the long run for some reason. 
There's a lot of experiments on this. It's like it doesn't like the whole term has come has become very uh, uh, fashionable in the last five years. It didn't. No one even knew about it five years ago. But it's really important in terms of financial planning. But could it have to do with need that people know what they need today and tomorrow and next week? That's very present. They know they have these bills to pay and everything. So money is worth a lot. Well, it's not. It's not even no. need. It's called I could give you this money that you never even had before. Right? I can give it to you in a week, this much, or I could give you um, more, but not a lot more, far in the future. So in a sense, it's a gift, no matter what. And people are, they want a lot more if it's in a week. Maybe because they can conceive of spending it. Right? But if it's far in the future, like whatever, I'll take a smaller amount. But also, conversely, they're willing to, people are willing to pay a lot of interest to get credit immediately. Right, for credit cards and things like that. But for the long run, for big loans, they're not, that are paid off over a long time in the future. That's, that's, not, that's a slightly different thing in terms of like payday loans versus a loan mortgage because of the security and the profile and stuff like that. We're just like trying to do apples and apples though. Okay. So basically it's like this. If it's a short term uh, uh, return on your, on your money, you want a huge amount of money. If there's a long-term return on your money, you'll take less, which is completely the opposite of what people would expect. right? But it's very much operational in what's called behavioral finance, which is very, very sexy. The guy that is one of the guys behind this, Richard Thaler and Cass Sinstein, are famous for this. I think they wrote this book, Nudge. Um, and one of them is, I think, the director of regulation in Obama's administration. Kind of a heavy-duty deal right? in terms of changing the way uh, government government operates. I'm bringing this in just as a mention because we're talking about, dis about discounting. All right, now, remember, there's this huge issue that also comes up in climate change that came up in the Stern report about the difference between risk and uncertainty. Okay, what is, what, which one can we quantify? Risk, can we quantify risk or uncertainty? Who says uncertainty? Quantify. Who knows what quantification means? Number on it. Put a number on it. Give me better than that. Calculated. What does a PDF mean? <laughs> Besides an Adobe portable document format. What's a PDF? Probability distribution function. Yes. Awesome. A probability distribution function. It essentially is, guess what? Your old familiar friend, the bell curve. Okay? We've got... Um, the highest, for the, the highest chance is that we're going to have this return, x percent. Let's call it, let's call it a um, gambling in Vegas, right? It's likely that you'll make zero dollars. That's not the right, the right idea. Um, the point spread on a game, okay? It's likely if you if you after you adjust the point spread on an on a on an athletic game. The point spread is going to be zero most of the time. That's going to be some X percent, right? A big blowout either way is less likely. It's a probability distribution, the probability distributed in a function, okay? A PDF. Now, if you have a PDF, flipping a coin, the average grade in this class, the scores of teams or players or whatever, if you have a PDF, then are you talking about risk or about uncertainty? Risk. Risk, because it's quantified. That's what I mean by quantified. Uncertainty is a lightning bolt strikes you, right? Or um, you win the lottery in a sense, but I, I guess it's, that's probably not true because the lottery has a statistical distribution except that you're down here in terms of the likelihood that you'll win. Um, falling in love is an uncertainty, right? Some people try and make it a numbers game, but it doesn't usually happen that way. So uncertainty is something you cannot quantify, right? And when you worry about things like climate change and is the ocean going to turn into a gooey soup, or is an asteroid going to destroy the Earth in 2012? Those are uncertainty, although we know it's not, because NASA says so. Those are uncertainty things, right? We cannot quantify it. And if you cannot quantify it, you can't place a bet against it, and you can't put a discount rate against it, right? 
So basically what Nicholas Stern said about climate change is there's some really big bad things out there that if they do happen are going to wipe out the human race. So we should invest now just to be sure because of risk aversion. Yes? Um, in terms of uncertainty versus risk, like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says there's a 90% chance that, you know, catastrophic climate change will occur. Mm -hmm. So is that purely risk? Is that a 90% chance? They've quantified it in terms of risk. Okay. That's right. Because uncertainty is, this could happen, it might not, we're not quite sure what's going to happen, right? The reason that they, the reason they come up with these 90% numbers is that they run models over and over again, trying different inputs in terms of uh, parameters and the, and the way the models interact. And they look at all the different results. They get a whole PDF, PDF of results in the future. Kind of imaginary, right? The, the, the naysayers on climate change are like, it's imaginary. Well, yeah, so is the NFL, right? So the thing is they get a distribution of outcomes and they say, 90% of our outcomes fall in this range, which means that we're 90% sure that this is gonna, that it's gonna, that it's gonna happen. Statistical um, jargon is, is difficult to present correctly, but it's, let's just say it this way, they're pretty sure that's gonna happen, right? Or climate change is happening. Do they make like a confidence interval? Yeah, it's a confidence interval, it's the same idea, okay? The whole idea of a confidence interval is that 90% of the time when you do this thing, it's gonna fall in that interval. Right? It doesn't mean it's not going to fall out of the interval, or it doesn't mean that 10% that of it is outside the interval. It means that 90% of the time, your random draw is going to be in that interval. Right? So in terms of climate change, they're basically saying 90% of our scenarios fall in this uh-oh scenario, so we should do something about it. 10% right? of the time, it's way worse, and 10% of the time, or 5% of the time, it's way worse. It's on one uh, uh, tail, and the other 5% is on the other tail. That's essentially what happened behind the Wall Street meltdown, is that when they did this PDF, this is a useful jargon to know. If anybody wants to read about the financial market, read The Black Swan. That's the most amazing book. So basically, if you have a, a PDF, you've got these tails, and this is a 1% chance, and this is a 5% chance. Okay, so you have a probability of ending up in one tail, right? When you have fat tails, that means that the reality, let's, oh, let's do it this way. This is the, what they, pr they predicted, and they're saying, well, this is never going to happen. That's a 0.001% chance. And this is a 0.1%. See that little teeny area under there? That's what they mean by, that's a small probability. If you have fat tails, it turns out that the likelihood of ending up in that end is much bigger than you thought. Right? And when they said in Wall Street, oh, it's a one in a thousand chance, one, one time in a thousand years, except it happens every four years, you know that the statistical models broke, right? And that's what happened. Their statistical models are based on a bunch of crap. Okay, so these are some background ideas in terms of what, I want, what I'm going to call cost-benefit analysis, or benefit-cost analysis. I tend to call it cost-benefit, but I don't care which way you guys do it. So, let's do it this way. Benefit <coughs> over cost. If you have this ratio, and it's discounted into present value, present dollars, and you're looking at that investment, is that a good idea to do that investment? To invest in that climate mitigation thing? To worry about, to, to invest in the housing market? To put money into your own education? Is that a good bet? Yes? Okay, greater than one. Now, what if your BC uh, project A is equal to 1.2 and project B is equal to 1.5 and you've done good analysis on both of them. Which one should you do? The lower one, right? You should do a higher benefit for your given cost. Okay? Did, it, did people see the airline uh, post I sent out? The baby seats on airlines? This was an I went. I had to read it because I was, I was pulling some number out. And I was telling you guys it was a two billion dollar life per life save. One point three billion dollars per life save. That's the benefit. No, sorry, that's the cost. The life is the benefit. The cost is one point three billion dollars. Okay. Now it's positive. The 
benefit. Oh, so no, is it positive? How do we, so we know the cost is 1.3 billion. What's the benefit? A life. What's the jargon for how much a life is worth in economics? Value of a statistical life, right? BSL, according to EPA, and that's the numbers, the kind of numbers they use when they're evaluating, you know, should we allow people to spray dioxin over each other or something like that? Okay? A BSL is, let's just round it up to $7 million. Life is not priceless. I already told you about the airline tickets, how Americans are worth more, right? This is an American. American. You've got 7 million benefit over 13, 1,300, 1,300 million. How's that BCA looking? Good night, good investment? No. So luckily the FAA actually realized this. Reagan, one of the good things that Reagan did is that he actually said we should use benefit cost analysis for regulations. It had not been done before. Right? The Environmental Protection Act, Endangered Species Act, Endangered Species Act has no provision for cost benefit. If you've been following the debates about water in the Delta, you will know that people are saying it's a three inch fish. People are, children are dying, lives are being forsaken. But there is no cost benefit for the Endangered Species Act. Okay? If the species is going to go extinct, it does not matter what cost you incur to humans and to society, you will act to defend that species. This can get very expensive. In my opinion, it's not true with the Delta, but it can get expensive in other places. Oh, let's do game theory for a second. Who's heard of the northern spotted owl? Good. And they live in forests. The forests are often used for what? Lumber. Huh? Lumber, right? They are logged. Now, you're walking along in your forest, and you're the corporate forester, and you see a northern spotted owl nest. And the regulation says, thou shalt leave the owl alone plus the surrounding 500 meters. And you say, oh good, I'm going to cordon off these 500 meters of trees that are worth $2 million, so we protect that owl, right? No. You kill the owl. Shoot, shovel, and shut up is what happens. And the interesting thing was because the people that had these owl habitats were not going to get any money for protecting the owl. So some clever environmentalists, the free market guys, have said, hey, how about we pay you to keep the owl there? You can grow your trees longer, maybe the owl might live, maybe they'll die of something not human, right? This actually started, the most famous example of this was the reintroduction of wolves to Yosemite National, no, to Yellowstone National Park. All the farmers were like, oh my god, wolves, they'll kill my sheep. And they just would shoot wolves on sight, regardless of whether or not the wolves were killing sheep. So that, the wolves, I think they were gray, I'm not sure, were essentially going extinct. And these guys said, hey, wait a second, if they kill your sheep and your sheep is worth 50 bucks, and the environmental value of a wolf is $5,000, which is it's kind of like they figured it out, right? If you lose a sheep, we'll pay you 50 bucks. And they went further than that, right? So the farmer, does he have incentive to kill? Not necessarily, right? It's like, I got a dead sheep. You have to certify it's wolf dead and all that stuff, right? But even they went further than that. If you have wolves that are having cubs on your property, we'll pay you a bounty of $1,000. So now farmers are like, oh, come here, little wolf, come here, come here. You know, they want to have little wolf cubs on their property. Look, 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 I got wolves, you know, stuff like that. Now the same thing happened, this incentive is quite good in terms of in, uh, trying to get people to, to, to make nature, you know, to, for nature to work for them. If you did the spotted owl, it's like, I got a spotted owl nest, give me a thousand bucks. And some enviro would write a check, that would be the theory, right? Except some enviros, they try and get things for free. Same thing with the national parks, especially in uh, developing countries. It's a park, keep all the, did I already do the park rampage with you guys? Keep all the, keep all the locals out, kick them out? because we have to have the, the gringos show up and pay 20 bucks or whatever. So they lose their house, they lose their hunting grounds, they don't get any money, and then like, the, the, the land rovers are zooming back and forth. So they become poachers or shooting the wildlife that nobody owns. 
right? And before Zimbabwe descended into utter darkness under Mugabe, they had one of the more popular and successful uh, wildlife programs where the local people would manage their wildlife. And they would sell the heads of a big megafauna. If you were a hunter and you wanted a, a, to kill an elephant, 15 grand, shoot them. And so the locals would love it. Come and shoot our elephants. $15,000, that's a good income. And what, what would they, would they defend elephants against poachers? Hell yeah, right? Those elephants are valuable, right? So that program was working to benefit the local community. It turns out in Southern Africa, you've got a much bigger problem in terms of too many elephants, not too few, right? But in places where they banned people hunting elephants and poaching and stuff like that, or uh, ivory sales, for example, you've got a black market, and who are the people that most likely shoot the elephants? Not just the locals, worse than that, around these parks. The rangers. The rangers shoot the elephants and then take the ivory and sell it to the black market. It ends up in Hong Kong and stuff like that. So um, think of the incentives. Think through the incentives. Benefit cost analysis. Okay, good. We're doing well. Now, the problem with benefit cost analysis is there's this thing called, uh, we're going to have a program about the future, and it's going to rescue uh, baby dolphins. And uh, I'm a baby dolphin fan, and I think they're, in fact, actually, I like eating baby, baby dolphins. They're really yummy. Baby dolphin sushi. I think they're worth only, in the environment, they're probably worth like 50 bucks. Does anybody have an opinion that's different than that? What's your what's a baby dolphin worth to you? Thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Oh yeah? Uh, fifty dollars. No. No, right? That's how the negotiations happen. No. So there's a problem of quantifying the values of these things, right? And this gets into the classical problem of what's called willingness to pay versus willingness to accept. And if I said to you, I want to kill a dolphin and eat the sushi, how much do I have to pay you to do it? You would say, and then I say, you know what? I actually have a little baby dolphin right here that I'm going to kill. <laughs> Unless you pay me, how much money? Yeah. How much are you going to pay me? Going to pay to save the dolphin? Oh, that would be unique. Ten thousand dollars. Sold. All right. So, how much is? But the thing is, is that there's tip, and I and I and I, you. Ha, I'll, I'll present this to you because you just said you just said you'd be willing to pay more than you'd be willing to accept, which is an unusual inversion, right? How much is a blue whale worth? A million dollars. You ask it. I'll give you a, 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 but here's what usually happens. Willingness to pay is less than willingness to accept. And we're not talking about, I don't have uh, an income constraint. It's basically when people say, oh, you're asking me how much money I want to kill that little charismatic beast? I want a lot. Right? How much am I willing to pay? Well, not that. Because I, I, you know, I, I got to get a big screen TV, and my kids got to go to private school, da, 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 right? So there's this huge problem of willingness to pay being less than willingness to accept, and that shows up all the time in environmental issues, right? How much is that old growth forest worth to you? Oh, so much. The Arctic Wildlife Refuge. What's the acronym for that? Anwar. Anwar, right? Anwar. That's worth. So who, who can even find it on the map? Good, congratulations. <laughs> right? But how much are you willing to pay? Well, I don't know. A dollar a year? Fifty dollars a year? Start writing checks. Right? Now this gets to the collective action problem called the oil companies can coordinate against you. But the part of that problem is that there's a little bit of, of an issue here with what you would call cheap talk. Which is, how much are you willing to accept? Oh, a million dollars. Because you can just say a million dollars. Right? And if I put hundred thousand dollars on the table, that yeah, you might be willing to let Flipper go. Right? 
That's real money at $100,000. Or even worse, if you say, oh, it's worth a million dollars to you, you pay me a million dollars. Then you go, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a second. No, I'm, but I'm right because I'm good, because I love the environment. Right? Being good and being right is not worth money. Money is worth money. Okay? This is a continuing, ongoing debate in environmental. This is environmental economics. This is not resource <laughs> economics. Environmental economics. What does that mean in terms of a market? There is no market. Right? You basically have people making up shit. Because there is no market. Oh, well, it's worth so much. So when you get into benefit cost analysis and you start putting in these kinds of numbers, then things start going crazy. Right? Because you know that redwood tree, when it's milled down into a paneling for your hot tub, is worth this much, right? What is it worth as a growing tree? There's a huge gap between willingness to pay and willingness to accept. If you put those numbers into benefit and the cost, then things start to move very fast, up and down. Some of the most, the biggest research on, uh, on this was around, um, I'll get to the hedge hedge in a second was around the oil spill in the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, right? Every oil bird that showed up on TV, people were willing to pay a lot. Or, even better, they were willing to accept a lot in terms of beating up uh, Exxon in court, right? That's why Exxon had to pay billions of dollars, because it was the court judgment was based on willingness to accept, okay? I actually, uh, my, one of my favorite examples of this, of this is Hetch Hetchy <coughs> Reservoir. You see, or it's called the, the Oshansi Dam and Hetch Hetchy Reservoir up in Yosemite. You guys know about that? Okay, it's the other Yosemite Valley. John Muir broke his heart because it got dammed up by those evil people from San Francisco. Around 1910 or something like that, they built this reservoir, they built a, a, a canal aqueduct to bring the water down to give uh, drinking water to San Francisco and the peninsula, and there's been a movement to restore Hetch Hetchy. Who's heard of the Restore Hetch Hetchy movement? Estimated price tag, $5 billion. Who remembers what, what this acronym means? OPM. Other people's money. Other people's money. Who's going to pay the $5 billion? We, the taxpayers. I did, the, did I do this rampage already? No? I'll give you the short version. Some people at Environmental Defense Fund and other organizations said we have to restore Hetch Hetchy because it's a good thing. So it costs $5 billion. My question is, are you guys willing to pay $5 billion? In fact, I said a much simpler number. I don't know, I just think too, the other, the other side, people are willing to pay, you know, billion dollars a week for, like, a war. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, it just seems like there's... Right, that's called switching... Like a disconnect. That's called changing the, the, uh, changing the argument to something else that you prefer to talk about. Right? No, I think so. I think it just kind of shows more people to like priorities, like what they are willing to pay for. Right, but we're not looking at the opportunity cost of Hetch Hetchy versus the Iraq War. We're looking at, should we spend $5 billion to restore Hetch Hetchy or not, right? It's very important. You're actually, it's a good point. Because people do change the topic immediately. I got into this debate with someone about NASA. He's like, but NASA's only 1% of the federal budget. I'm like, that doesn't mean you can waste money still, right? A billion here, a billion there, after a while it adds up. That's the expression, right? So if you treat Hetch Hetchy alone as a question, then you have to ask, um, Five billion dollars. Okay, environmental defense. I said this guy just pisses him off. Well, wouldn't it make more sense to say instead of five billion, how much it would cost like, per person or per taxpayer? That was exactly right. But I, I made it simpler than that. I said, if you can find a thousand people to donate five thousand dollars each to pay for this, your donors, right? You got a mailing list. Five thousand people, five thousand dollars each. How much money is that? Five thousand uh, uh, sorry, thousand people, five thousand dollars each. How much is that? Nope. Five million. Five million is still one tenth of one percent of the total cost of that project. Right? So basically I said as a threshold called I will talk to you about this question, not that I have any power. But I'm not even gonna talk to you guys unless you've got one tenth of one percent of money on the table to pay for it. 
And I bet they couldn't even get that. Because they would rather have it come out of the general fund. And they, they'll have lots of bumper stickers that say, Save Hetch Hetchy. Those cost two ninety five, dollars right? But ask for $5,000 from that person with the bumper sticker. And then you'll find out where they really, if they're really willing to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. But isn't it not fair? Because it's not like only those 1,000 people will benefit. If everyone will benefit, people just don't, people just have different like, Perfect. That's a perfect segue. Everyone will benefit and everyone will pay, right? Every person in the state of California, I think this, uh, if you assume 50 million people, that's still $100 per person in California. I prefer Hetch Hetchy the way it is. Will you give me $100 to restore it? Will you give me $100? He didn't do it. Now I need 200 <laughs> 300 Can you give me 300 yeah, okay, good. <laughs> okay, you see how that becomes a problem? That's just on the cost side. The benefit is usually, oh, what about everybody? And there's this awesome argument that was brought forward by, guess what, someone from San Francisco. And he said, hey, if we had $5 billion, what's that word? Opportunity cost, right? We could spend $5 billion on urban parks to help poor people. Because who would go to Hetch Hetchy? A bunch of Enviros and Volvos, right? who are like 300 people in the whole state. Right? So let's leave it at that. We'll get on to more of this stuff on Tuesday. See you with your homeworks. Have a good weekend.